South Dakota's Crow Creek Indian community is rated the poorest Indian reservation in the nation, and its members often refer to themselves as the forgotten people. Located on the banks of the Missouri River, Crow Creek is just 50 miles east of Pierre, South Dakota's state capital. It is home to approximately 2,700 Dakota Native Americans whose ancestors in 1863 were exiled from Minnesota following the U.S. Dakota Uprising. Following a harsh winter, hundreds of imprisoned Fort Snelling Dakota survivors were herded like cattle onto a single boat and dropped off at this strange wasteland just north of what is today Chamberlain. Traveling this gruesome boat journey, Presbyterian Minister Reverend John P. Williamson described these conditions in a letter to his mother in 1863. 1,300 Indians were crowded like slaves and fed on musty hardtack and briny pork, which they had not half a chance to cook. Diseases bred in these 1,300 souls that landed at Crow Creek June 1, 1863, were soon reduced to 1,000. A teepee where no one was sick could scarcely be found, and it was a rare day when there was no funeral. The hills were covered with graves. The very memory of Crow Creek became horrible to the Santee Dakota Indians who still hush their voices at the mention of the name. Crow Creek is synonymous with overcrowded and substandard housing, inadequate water, sewer and health care, along with other social ills including high alcoholism, suicide and school dropout rates. Work opportunities, higher education and hope are virtually non-existent. <laughs> Probably a couple of the biggest concerns here on this reservation is, is the health and the employment and just the normal standards of living that a lot of people take for granted. These people up here don't have. about to see real footage from real people and about real people in the uh, Crow Creek Reservation of South Dakota. The people that have very acute needs, often in very desperate situations, and our intent, speaking on behalf of the city of Winona, is to help where we can. Uh, the intent of this film, in the end, is to see if we can all experience and, and understand uh, what, what's happening at Crow Creek and how we all might help in that effort. The issues that are facing us are, are lack of housing. We need um, in big, or need a lot of more help in the areas of housing. And the problem here at the mold is there is remediation available. But the problem is you can knock it off the surface, but it's inside the jet board, it's inside the insulation, the spores are still there. So we can knock it off the surface, but we can't kill it. And you actually got to get a fungicide and kill it. But the problem is shortage of money. Again, we got so much, you know, Hello, is this Jeannie? priority. We got plumbing fixtures Jeannie? and stuff like that to fix up that it takes priority over something like this. But this is really a health hazard. Um, what kind of percentage of the housing on, on the reservation has this particular uh, mold? Uh, I'd say between 30 to 50 oh, okay. percent, uh, to varying degrees, of course. Some are yeah. really, really bad. It's really bad in overcrowded houses where there's more people living in the house, so you have more moisture with showers, laundry, yeah. all that stuff. That's yeah. where it gets really bad is in overcrowded houses. And I think this house is probably an example yeah. of that. They see where they're trying to cover it up, but. Uh, no matter what you do, it comes back. That's so. That's probably the major problem. That's why all these kids have breathing problems. That's just from poor, poor construction. When these houses are built, they just uh, they slapped them together. A lot of times, they didn't even use caulking around the windows or the siding, so the wind just blows right through these houses. Moisture sets in, and it never leaves. Right below where I live, Dad, there's a well, and it, it's so bad you can't even drink it. And uh, what my nephew, 
that's the water he's got to use in his house. But he wanted any water to drink, he got to buy it. And uh, about a hundred feet from his well, they dug another one and they condemned it. It's undrinkable. What do you do for septic tanks or sewage there, treatment? Is well, there? All, all there is is each house individually has a, a septic tank and a drain field. But <laughs> I've always was told that you know you ain't supposed to be your water lines and all that ain't supposed to be too close to you. But it they're they're side by side. Really. So I don't know, but then you stop and look, and this uh, waste that goes in the ground, that's got to get down into the water table. It's hard to find jobs down here. We do what we can, we get by and stuff. In some cases, in, in a household of as many as 10, there may be nobody who truly has employment. The, the um, employment here is just virtually non-existent. There's no chance for them to, to go beyond just mere existence. Now it's, uh, it's men my age that are committing suicide because they can't provide for their families, they can't get a job, they can't pay the bills. Um, I lost a very good friend of mine here a couple of months back. He committed suicide um, just for the fact that he, he just gave up. And then we had another crisis last week. They closed down our Head Start program. Our Head Start program is like a preschool to kindergarten. Uh, the, the building is so infested with mold, it can't be fixed. Uh, the, the temporary building was put just on the ground. There was no foundation laid for it to be put on. So they think that has something to do with the mold really, you know, infesting in there. But what are these children going to do? Where are they? I mean, you come from a home that's infested with mold, and you go to a place that offers you a little safety, a meal, a chance to learn something, get ahead of the game a little bit, and you go into that place and it's full of mold. What we have to take into account are um, our poverty level or our, our children's school, or our children's home life, where they come from, and, and the unemployment rate, so all of that have to be taken in here as a factor. But we do need new units for like the special ed and the chapter reading trailers. Sure. Actually, they've been, con well, the chapter one reading trailer's been condemned for the last five years, but we just have no money to replace it, so we do the best we can. students do better with student uh, teachers that are native and also the, the native teachers from around here they end up usually sticking around here because they got a vested interest in the community because right now the number of native american um, teachers that we have on staff is you know, very, very minimal and we've been without a gymnasium for a couple of years and that's been really difficult on a couple of different reasons not only for the athletic events but uh, our pe classes you know we don't mm -hmm. there's no place to have regular PE classes. You've got to either use the outside court when it's nice or, you know, do stuff in a, in a cramped weight room that we have. Right now, anything would help. Right now, you know, if people could actually come down here and see the true 
let's see, how do you say it, the true human spirit that has carried people for centuries, who carried it, what's carried us as a human race of survival and adaptability, they'll see that in these people. Of every, um, every single person here on the, within the confines of this reservation, a very adaptable, Spirits might be down, but their hearts are always there as far as survival. They know how to survive. Once again, going back to, to our, our friends and neighbors and relatives in Minnesota and, and uh, uh, everything that's uh, unfolding in this day and age that uh, maybe it'll bring about the reality and the realization that uh, it's time to um, Time to take another look at, at the Indian people and, and uh, per se, uh, get them out of captivity. Optimism runs deep among those who have stepped forward to lend assistance and conditions begin to slowly improve at Crow Creek. This past year, the Diversity Foundation of Minnesota, the City of Winona, along with various southern Minnesota communities and churches, have come together to organize charitable drives and begin developing a support network with and among these Dakota descendants whose ancestors once hunted and called southern Minnesota their ancestral homeland. To many Crow Creek residents, the nearly one dozen semi-loads of furniture, clothes, books, and donations have initiated hope and some trust along with beginning the process of reconciliation with the Dakota Nation in response to our U.S. government's negative past history of broken promises with the American Indian. Beginning steps are underway. The Diversity Foundation of Minnesota and the City of Winona invite your participation as much more can and needs to be done in this intercultural spirit of reconciliation journey. Immediate involvement and financial assistance is paramount to providing hope and at last improving the Crow Creek conditions, economics, and the self-esteem of these forgotten people. And part of why I jumped aboard is because I really do believe in what they're doing. We need to acknowledge the work of Ed Lomas and Lyle Rusted and the Diversity Foundation because they have been trailblazers in many, many ways. And I know this alliance you have formed here is due to some of that hard work and effort that they've done over the years. So I thank you, gentlemen, very much.